Hello everybody, once again this is Fred Gonkwa coming to you from our studios in Chicago with another edition of Bold Talk on Allen TV. And as usual, I like to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you, depending on where you are around the world. My main topic today is about Herbert Uyigwe. Specifically, my topic, topic is about the danger of a single story in the way that Herbert Uyigwe's acquisition of Access Bank has been presented by some writers who have been writing a lot of things since he died. At a TED Talk presentation a few years ago, Chima Amanda Adichie talked about the danger of a single story. That's what we're facing today with Herbert Uigwe's story. But since we're taking from writers, let me also do a parody taken from Shakespeare in Julius Caesar, where he said, Fellow countrymen and women, lend me your ears. We are here to crucify Herbert Uyghwe and not to praise him. The evil that men do live after them. So let it be with Herbert Uyghwe. My last episode was a tribute to Herbert Uyghwe. I preempted that tribute by saying that prior to the helicopter crash, I never heard of Herbert Uyghwe, didn't know who he was, but I'm just finding out. I watched an interview Oji Okbe of Arise TV had with the man, and I was drawn to his passion for his wife, his children, and his extended family. The only reason I did that tribute was because I felt that that's how a man should relate to his family, his wife, and his children. Ironically, a story started coming out about how Access Bank was acquired. I saw that there is a different side to the man. It is that different side and the irony of his family life and the business life that I want to address. But while I address it, let's be fair and let's follow the history of Nigeria and how things became what they are. There's always a cause and an effect. Many people who choose to be closed-minded are not going to like the things I say, but like I've always said, when Nigeria decides to go back and look at its history and the atrocities that Nigeria has committed, then we can start talking about collectively fixing Nigeria. But a lot of times when you talk about those atrocities in Nigeria, the people who those atrocities have historically favored tend to turn around and call me tribalistic. I'm not being tribalistic, but you're not going to intimidate me into not bringing out these atrocities, the people it has favored, and how we can move Nigeria forward. There is a natural mystic flowing through the air. Do -do -do -do. Do -do -do. If you listen carefully now, you will hear. Do -do -do -do. This could be the first trumpet. Might as well be the last. Many more will have to suffer. Many more will have to die. Don't ask me why. 
Things are not the way they used to be. I wouldn't tell no lies. Folks, I wouldn't tell no lies. But it's really shameful that a man died. A man hasn't been buried. Died alongside his wife and his son and a close friend. And within days of his death, what's flooded the news in Nigeria about his life was how dubiously Access Bank was acquired. Can I lend my voice to saying that the way Access Bank was acquired was dubious? Very dubious, very rotten. If I was talking to Herbert Uyugwe, I wish he was alive today, my commentary will tell it to his face that what they did to acquire Access Bank was dubious. But I'll also make it clear to Nigerians, there was nothing illegal that Herbert Uyugwe did in acquiring Access Bank. Herbert Uyugwe took advantage of a rotten system, a rotten system that's been created by a Fulani cabal, a system to favor their tools, their cabal-pocketed tools across the country, whether it's Igbos, Yorubas, Fulanis, Hausas, Edos, it doesn't matter, as long as these are tools they use to oppress whoever they want to oppress. Now it's coming home to roost. And what Herbert Uyghur did will be duplicated tomorrow if Nigerians soon forget all this nonsense and focus on the truth and follow that truth wherever it may lead. I continue to tell you guys that every time I do my shows, I'm going to keep pumping in memories of Biafra because the atrocities going on in Nigeria today started in 1966 when a dubious Fulani cabal went on a rampage, killing Igbos in the north, and the rest of Nigerians pretended nothing was happening, and joined the dubious Fulani to fight a war against Igbos, whose only crime was that they decided that if Nigeria wouldn't defend our people in the north and any other part of the country, we need to go home and defend ourselves. That was Igbo's crime. Now let's deal with the topic at hand. <clears throat> what, what, what Herbert Uyghwe and AIG Mokwede did to acquire Access Bank was terrible. I would like to say it was criminal, but it wasn't criminal. It was allowed by the law, but it's shameful, it's disgraceful, and it needs to be stopped. Having said that, what they did with the loan they got from Intercontinental Bank with, uh, I think it's Erasmus, Akinbola, $16 billion loan, $16 billion Naira loan that was never paid back. It's shameful, disgraceful, and condemnable. What Lamido Sanusi did to declare Intercontinental Bank insolvent is dubious, condemnable, and disgraceful. The role Saraki played was condemnable, deplorable, and disgraceful. With that said, Herbert Uyghwe, in these four names I just mentioned, is the fourth name removed 
from the beginning of these dubious activities. Why do I say that? Lamido Sanusi was the governor of Central Bank. Saraki was the person who connived with him, according to the story that I read. AIG Mokwede was the person, or is the person who was classmates with Lamido Sanusi at King's College. Old Boys Connection. Herbert Wigwe was a colleague and a friend of Imokwede that joined because the advantage was there for him to work with Imokwede to accomplish what they were trying to do. I wouldn't do those kind of things and that's why I'm not in banking and that's why I'm not in any kind of business that requires people to eat people to survive. But the reality is that the stories that are coming out shows that the entire banking system in Nigeria is dirty. The dirt did not start with Herbert Uyugwe and it will not stop with Herbert Uyugwe unless we put in process today, not tomorrow, unless we put in process starting today structures that will stop these kind of loopholes from giving advantage to the well-connected. <clears throat> the reason I decided to get involved, I'm not a banking person, this is not my forte, but my last episode did a tribute to Herbert Uyugwe. And I clearly stated that I knew nothing about Herbert Uyugwe, never heard his name prior to the helicopter crashing that killed him, but saw an interview he did with Oji Okbe of Arise TV. And I was very touched and moved by his dedication to his wife, his children, and his extended family. But I also saw another interview with Atado Pedersaid, who is a banker too, and Mustafa Chikobi, who is directly or indirectly in banking. None of them talked about banking and none of them talked about Uyghur's wealth. Both of them talked about the same thing his humanitarian side, his kindness. That's what attracted me to do the story that I did last time. Because how he acquired, acquired Access Bank, I've stated in so many ways since that it was wrong. But we did nothing legally wrong in the process he used to behind the scenes acquire enough shares to surprise the shareholders and take over the majority shares in the bank with Imokwede. They did nothing wrong. Based on world corporate takeover standards, they did nothing wrong. It was an aggressive corporate takeover it's shameful, it's disgraceful anywhere in the world, but that's how it's done. Couple that with a very rotten, corrupt country, which Nigeria is. It's even doubly wrong, grossly wrong, but legally they did nothing wrong. The Nigerian rotten, Nigerian Fulani Kabal Tinubu system in Nigeria is what continues to do things wrong that creates those kind of loopholes for those things to happen. And now that I've said all that, why don't we look at other aspects of Nigeria? In 1970, when the Civil War ended, and Nigeria decided to give 20 pounds to every Igbo person, whether you're a houseboy with five pounds in your account, or zero balance, or negative balance, or whether you're a millionaire with millions of pounds in the bank. <coughs> the 
the Fulani cabal and their agents in Nigeria dubiously gave Igbos 20 pounds as a rehabilitation welcome back to Nigeria. That hurt Igbos. I would like the writers who have been pounding on this Uyghur story and his acquisition of Access Bank, I'd like them to go back and research what led to the decision to give Igbos 20 pounds when they had more money in the bank and then show sympathy 50 plus years later. Apologize to Igbos for what you did to them then. Then I'll listen to your story about what happened to Intercontinental Bank and Access Bank. It's the danger of a single story. We tell stories the way that it favors us, rightfully so, because the story that man told is a rotten story. I'm not supporting what we were did, but all of you who are now trying to crucify we were on ice. Today it's we were on ice. He hasn't even been buried. I hope you'll go back and crucify everybody that was instrumental in the decision to give Igbos 20 pounds at the end of the war. If you think you're fair. And also of recent memory. Dangote is the wealthiest black man on earth. I'm happy for him. He's Nigerian. When I walk around America, people say he's Nigerian. The wealthiest man is Dangote from his country. I pump my chest out. But let's look at how Dangote became the wealthiest man in the world. How fair was it under Obasanjo's administration? for Dangote to be given the monopoly to be the only one importing rice, cement. There's another major product. Irrespective of who was in that business before that may have had more influence in that business. There's a man from Newi called Ibeto. He had the biggest cement business in Nigeria before that deal was given to Dangote. But not just that, he had a shipment worth tens of millions of dollars on the high sea. Coming into Nigeria, they were all stopped. It was wasted. That man almost died because of that business decision that went bad because a rotten system is willing to pull the plug on an unfavorite child and give it to the favorite son. Where is the fairness in Nigeria? Before you say that I'm supporting what Uyghur did in acquiring Access Bank, don't put words in my mouth. What Wewe and Imokwede and Lamido and Saraki did was wrong. But the Nigerian loopholes created by the Fulani cabal and the Tinubu cabal, and many of you criticizing me are Tinubu supporters. As we speak, it's a different topic for my next episode. Why don't you go look at the atrocities that the indicted guy from Georgia, uh, Bajabia Miller, go look at the things he's been doing since this administration started and all the plans he has, including planning to shut down social media so that they could commit their atrocities unknown to Nigerians. Folks, don't get me started. If you get me started, I'll keep going on and on and on. All I can say is, may Herbert Wigwe's soul rest in peace. May Nigerians use this as an opportunity to now go back and question our leaders and the banking system and the people who make the banking laws 
and see that these loopholes are fixed so that we don't have another Herbert Uigwe and uh, AIG Imokwede taking over another bank that shouldn't be insolvent, being made insolvent because they are favorite children to the people who make the laws. That's where our focus needs to be and not on crucifying a man that's already dead because people are coming from their ulterior motived distortion journalism that they learned from Bayo Nonuga and Dele Alake and the people who want to distort the stories in Nigeria in a way that it always finds a way. Let me add another one that I shouldn't let go. How about we ways from Ikwere? Are those not your favorite Igbos that you used to fight Ojuku and fight Igbos when it was convenient for you? So the Wigwes were beautiful when it was convenient for you to use them. But when it's not convenient, you write your stories without saying what your real intention is. But your real intention is to say, oh, Igbos are greedy. Look at what Wigwe did. Wigwe is the fourth person in line in this atrocity that was committed. Why don't we put the flashlight on Lamido Sanusi, Saraki, and Imokwede, and not Wigwe, who is not here to defend himself? I've even seen some Igbos who are sharing that story like, this is terrible. It is terrible. But while you're saying it's terrible, read between the damned lines. It's the same stories about trying to paint an Igbo man black. Iquerez are Igbos, but we case Tinubu's best friend. When it's convenient, he uses Wike. Then Wike fails him tomorrow. By Ononuga and Dele Alake will come and write about him, not as Wike, the man that benefited Tinubu's election rigging, but Wike, the Igbo man. When it's convenient, these people are Igbos. Elume Elu, I've been waiting for anybody in, in the report since the election to talk about Elume Elu as an Igbo man. He's an Igbo man from Delta. But all of you conveniently pronounce his name like it's, oh, Elumelu, Elumelu. He's an Igbo man, another convenient Igbo that was used during the Civil War to fight against Ojuku and Biafra. But now when these stories start coming out and Elumelu's own involvement in killing the banking system in Nigeria starts coming out, you're going to start amplifying it as an Igbo man. Emefiele, he was convenient. You can't give that kind of... Yeah, you gave... Emefiele took over Central Bank. What crime did Emefiele, the thief, commit that was not committed with the approval of Buhari? Has Tinubu brought in Buhari and his cohorts to prosecute them? Has Tinubu sent EFCC against Buhari? If Buhari was an Igbo man, he'll be sitting in jail. That's the Nigeria we live in. In, in 1983, they did a coup that brought in Buhari into office. The president that they overthrew was Shagari. He was under house arrest. The vice president, Chief Ekweme, was in jail. That's the Nigeria we live in. To hell with that Nigeria. When you guys decide you want to fix Nigeria, let's all fix these atrocities together. What Herbert Wigwe did in acquiring Access Bank was bad. But Herbert Wigwe was four persons removed in the atrocities that led to acquiring Access Bank. Let's focus on Imokwede, 
San, uh, Sanusi and Saraki. Let's go after all the bankers. Let's start in the let's start with the bankers in the Fulani land, the bankers in the Hausa land, the bankers in the Yoruba land, the bankers in Igbo land, who you've all buried. Go find how many Igbos are really up there in banking. They've all been buried or insolvented out of business because of these dubious loopholes that exist. Let's go clean up the banking system. Close your eyes, make it tribeless. Let's clean it. When we all decide to clean Nigeria together, I'll do a commentary on the beauty of Nigerians, Igbos, Yorubas, Hausas, Fulanis, working together to clean the rot. But until that rot is cleaned, Every Nigerian is welcome to the rot, including Igbos. I'm embarrassed about what we, we, we did with Access Bank, but we is equally Nigerian. To hell with this Nigeria, where the news is always one-sided. The danger of a single freaking story. Now, as my padding shot. Let's keep the record straight. Not once have I said that the method by which Herbert Wigwe and his partner acquired Access Bank was ethical. If anything, I said it was rotten. What I said is that it's a rotten country that created the rotten loopholes, that created the rotten opportunities for people like Herbert Wigwe and his partners to have the audacity to do the things they did to sink Intercontinental Bank. Let's uniformly clean up the rot. We can't pick and choose whose rot is sweet and whose rot is rotten. If what Herbert Wigwe did, which we all agree was bad, was bad, why don't you, the writer of this story, go back and do Nigerians, Nigerians a favor and investigate the entire banking industry in Nigeria and the banking CEOs and bring us a comprehensive story about the banking rot in Nigeria, so that you could show that that rot includes Fulanis and Yorubas and Igbos and Hausas and Edo's and everybody involved in it. Just like the oil, oil industry involves all the tribes, it's all the cabal pocketed people that are sinking the country. But when those cabal pocketed people are from a certain tribe, it's covered up and swept under the rug. And when those cabal pocketed people are from a different stepchild tribe, idiots come out to write garbage. That's all I'm saying. I'm not supporting rot. Rot is rot. Let's fix the rot. Chief Body George came out with an honest interview weeks before Herbert Wicke died and told a candid Nigerian concerned story about the rot going on in the banking industry. And he named names. And in those names, he named Igbos, he named at least one Yoruba person. He named people across the board. That's how you measure a man that has good intentions and not writers that come out after a man dies to tell stories that are already stories that are out there, but they come out in a way that taints one person but doesn't paint the whole picture. That's all I'm saying. And to Chief Buddy George, 
Thank you for being the first person to bring this story out in a way that we caught it on social media. And finally, let me remember Herbert Uigwe the only way that I care to remember him in this rotten country called Nigeria. And may his soul rest in peace. What do you consider your most treasured possession? My wife, obviously. My wife, obviously. Fantastic, and why is that? My strongest asset and my greatest cheerleader and uh, my greatest strength by far. What are the three things you can't live without? Very difficult question. I think my children and my wife, which is basically my family. <laughs> so your family, your sanctuary, and your work. Yes, very important to me. Fantastic. What's your idea of perfect happiness? Spending time with my children. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, this is Fred Wankor coming to you from our studios in Chicago with an angry edition of Bull Talk on Allen TV. And until next time, good night and God bless. Oh,